Dear fellow neonatologists, colleagues and friends, I'm very pleased and a great honor to be with you here at the third ENN conference. I would like to thank the conference organizers, in particular, Professor Jean Pierre, for their most kind and generous invitation and for their wonderful organizing work. As we all know, the relation, the relation between form and history has been a hot topic for debate in the field of narratology since the 1980s. Former narrative poetics, which originated in Paris, has been criticized for decontextualization. Rhetorical narrative theory, although figuring as a post-classical approach since the 1990s, has likewise been criticized for, neg for neglecting social historical context. But if we examine the contextualist challenges to formal narrative poetics, we may find that the efforts to contextualize poetics actually come up with decontextualized structural distinctions. Since, as I will argue, the investigation of generic structures requires, by nature, leaving aside very specific contexts. I use generic in the sense of pertaining to the narrative genre or to a specific genre of narrative. Uh, in the case of rhetorical narrative theory, contextualist challenges also function to bring into play the historicizing potential in the theory itself. Um, my paper on this potential is forthcoming from the American Journal Narrative. It will come out in the May issue. Uh, this historicizing potential has been blocked from view for various reasons. That is to say, the, the contextualist challenges function to consolidate rather than to subvert the fundamental principles of formal narrative poetics and the rhetorical narrative theory. I will start by considering the relation between poetics and the contextualization. Although the situation varies in different countries or with different perspectives, many recent accounts of the development of narratology tell stories of evolution from classical narratology to post-classical narr contextualist narratologies. These stories vary, but one idea is shared in common. That is, the decontextualized formal investigation of generic structures has been and should be abandoned, and the narratologists should always take context into account. But if we examine respectively narratological theorizing and the narratological criticism, often occurring since the late 1980s in the same narratological study. A different picture emerges. In terms of narratological criticism, the picture is indeed one of evolution from a text-based investigation subject to formalist limitations to a more valid and fuller investigation that takes into account contexts and the readers. In terms of narratological theorizing, however, the picture is more complicated. Post-classical or contextualist narratologists have greatly enriched narratological theorizing in various ways. But when the investigation is concerned with generic stru textual structures and their generic functions, there is usually no room or no need to take into account very specific contexts. Formal narrative poetics, in the shape of newly established decontextualized structural models, in fact, has appeared continuously in contextualist narratologies, which have also drawn quite extensively on classical narrative poetics in contextual criticisms. That is to say, the investigation of generic textual structures in post-classical narratologies, in fact, functions to consolidate formal narrative poetics rather than to subvert it. Of the various contextualist narratologies, feminist narratology has played a pioneering and a very significant role in preserving and enriching formal narrative poetics. Feminist narratology came into being in North America in the 1980s when structuralist narratology was very much excluded from the scene by the joint forces of deconstructive and social historical approaches. Under, the uh, under such circumstances, 
Feminist narratologists helped to save formal narrative poetics through combining narratology with a feminist criticism. While defending structuralist narratology, feminist narratology as a contextualist approach is unequivocally critical of formal narrative poetics. The criticism centers on two related issues, one being gender blind and the other decontextualization. In her book, The Narrative Act, a study attempting to forge a feminist poetics of point of view, Susan Nancy criticizes structuralist narratology for, among other things, I quote, an adherence to a supposedly value-free methodology, and most critically, an isolation of texts from actual literary contexts and from their ideological base, end quote. But a close look at the theoretical distinctions feminist narratologists propose will reveal that the investigation of generic structures in striking contrast with narratological criticism defies by nature the consideration of specific social historical contexts. Let's first consider the distinction made by Lancer between public and private narration. In her influential essay, Towards a Feminist Narratology, Nancy says, by public narration, I mean simply narration implicitly or explicitly addressed to a narratee who is external, that is heterodigenic to the textual world, and who can be equated with a public readership. Private narration, in contrast, is addressed to an explicitly designated narratee who exists only within the textual world. Not surprisingly, Nancy's distinction is very much decontextualized and gender indifferent. Indeed, as far as such structural classifications themselves are concerned, diversified specific contexts only form irrelevant di digressions. As Lanza points out, a major benefit of narratology is that it offers a relatively independent pretextual framework for studying groups of texts. While the investigation of groups of texts or specific texts as communicative acts need to take account of the varied contexts, the establishment of the relatively independent or pretextual framework necessarily requires lifting texts as structural illustrations out of their contexts in order to distill from them the essential structures concerned. Interestingly, Nancy's study of women's texts has led her to formalize and decontextualize sex as a narratological category. In Sexing the Narrative, Nancy writes, quote, written on the body leads me to recognize that sex is a common, if not constant element of narrative, so long as we include it but we include its absence as a narratological variable. Such an inclusion allows us to make some very simple formal observations about any narrative. That the sex of its narrator is or is not marked, and if marked, is marked male or female, or shifts between the two. One might well classify heterodigetic and homodigetic narratives according to their marking or non-marking of sex, and according to the ways in which sex gets marked. Overtly, through explicit designation, or covertly, through conventional aspects of gender that suggest but do not prove sex. Not surprisingly, this theoretical distinction of sex is as formal and decontextualized as a classical structural distinctions. In the case that the narrator's sex is unmarked or marked only covertly, the reader's inferences of the narrator's sex may vary from individual to individual or from context to context. But the theoretical distinction between marked and unmarked or between covertness and overtness has to be made in an abstract and a decontextualized way. This case lends strong support to the point I've been driving at. That is, 
The classification of generic structures defies by nature, contextualization or requires by nature, leaving aside the consideration of social historical context. In a similar fashion, we could formalize the narrator's race, class, religion, ethnicity, education, marital status, or sexual preference, all of which can be either marked or unmarked, and if marked, can be marked either overtly or covertly in the text. Once an attempt is made to theorize those non-structural elements, that is the sex, race, class, religion, ethnicity, etc., as narratological categories, it also becomes necessary to lift the texts out of their contexts and to distill from them the distinguishing properties concerned. Such non-structural elements, that is to say, cannot enter the realm of poetics unless they are transformed into decontextualized formal distinctions. Chatterman observes that contextualist narratologists, narratologists argue for the need to inquire into the in intentions, motivations, interests, and the social circumstances of real authors and audiences. Failure to make this kind of inquiry, they believe, dooms narratology to a treatment of narrative as a detached and a decontextualized entity. But as far as the investigation of generic structures is concerned, there is, in effect, nothing wrong with decontextualization, since that is the only possible way to do it, even in the case of sex. Let's shift attention briefly to another contextualist approach, cognitive narratology. I'll take David Herman's influential book, Story Logic, as an example. The book rethinks, quote, narrative as a strategy for creating mental representations of the world, unquote, and emphasizes the necessity of contextualizing formal description. In chapter nine, entitled Contextual Anchoring, attention is directed to the process by which cues in narrative discourse trigger recipients to establish a more or less direct or oblique relationship between the stories they are interpreting and the contexts in which they are interpreting them. Herman focuses on the second person you as a special case of person dexes. While the actual occurrences of narrative you in specific narratives are anchored in contexts, once an effort is made to classify the different types of you as a theoretical framework, we still have to lift the texts out of their contexts in order to distill from them the structural, property, the structural properties concerned. Herman offers a comprehensive classification of five types of you in second person fictions. A, generalized you. B, fictional reference. C, fictionalized, that's horizontal address. D, apostrophic, vertical address. E, double didactic U. The different types are all determined solely by essential structural properties. The first two types, A, generalized U, B, fictional reference, are marked by uncoupling of the grammatical form of U from its didactic functions. Type A is impersonal, generalized, pseudo-didactic, or non-didactic. Type B, in contrast, refers to the narrator protagonist by what um, Mogling calls didactic transfer. In making the classification, the various examples Herman cites from O'Brien's novel, A Pagan Place, only serve as structural illustrations, playing the same illustrative role as the hypothetical examples. In Herman's classification, each type of you has its generic function, which is shared by different occurrences of the same type across contexts, and which is therefore to be distinguished from contextualized significance. Precisely because Herman's classification of the different types of you is based on generic textual features without being affected by the diversity of readers and the contexts 
in the same genre. The classification yields valuable new tools for the poetics of second-person narration. By now, post-classical narratologists have enjoyed a history of two or three decades, and the narrative criticism has long been contextualized. But classical structural concepts are still popular, such as focalization and free indirect discourse. We can trace the historical development of the specific uses of free indirect discourse in the history of, say, French women's narrative or Afri African American narrative. But we all agree on the basic structural properties of free indirect discourse as a category of formal narrative poetics. The basic structural properties shared by the uses of different indirect discourse, of, uh, of the different uses of free indirect discourse across cultural and the historical contexts. Both through using classical poetic concepts and through coming up with new decontextualized structural distinctions, contextualist narratologists have made significant contributions to formal narrative poetics. The investigation of generic structures by contextualist narratologists actually help consolidate and develop formal narrative poetics rather than to subvert it. But of course, instead of being concerned only with universal narrative poetics, post-classical narratologists pay more attention to the generic structures of specific narrative genres, such as second-person narration. That is to say, we have minor diversification coexisting with a major consolidation. I'll now proceed to the second issue, that is contextualized rhetoric. Although feminist narratology, cognitive narratology, and rhetorical narratology are all influential post-classical approaches, the rhetorical approach has been criticized for failing to take into account social historical contexts. This approach has been mainly developed or initiated by the second and third generations of the Chicago School of Criticism. Both within and outside the Chicago School, there have been critical attempts that try to rectify the de decontextualization of the rhetorical approach. The critics involved take their attempts either as a rebellion against or as challenges to the rhetorical tradition. But I will argue and show that these attempts actually function to realize the contextualizing potential in rhetorical theory itself. Let me start with the key rhetorical concept of the implied author, which has been widely used and hotly debated on in narratological studies. When putting forward the concept in the rhetoric of fiction, William Booth says, here I have a long quote, but I, I suppose uh, it must be very familiar. To some novelists, it has seemed, indeed, that they were discovering or creating themselves as they wrote. As Jasmine West says, it is sometimes only by writing the story that the novelist can discover, not his story, but its writer. That's the novelist himself in the writing process. The official scribe, the, the, the official scribe, so to speak, for that narrative. Whether we call this implied author an official scribe or adopt the term recently revived by Kathleen Tillerson, the author's second self, it is clear that the picture the reader gets of this presence is one of the author's most important effects. However impersonal he may try to be, his reader will inevitably construct a picture of the official scribe who writes in this manner. Okay, the implied also is the official scribe who writes in this manner. Just as one's personal letters imply different versions of oneself, depending on the differing relationships with each correspondent and the purpose of each letter, so the writer, the implied author, sets himself out with a different air depending on the needs of particular works. In note seven of the quotation, Booth writes, Miss West continues, writing is a way of playing parts, of trying on masks, or assuming roles. 
not for fun, but out of desperate need, not for the self's sake, but for the writing's sake. And in note eight, oh. and in note eight of the same page, Booth quotes Tillerson's words in her inaugural lecture at the University of London. Writing on George Eliot in 1877, Dowden said that the form that most persists in the mind after reading her novels is not any of the characters, but the one who, if not the real George Eliot, is that second self who writes her books, the second self who writes her books, and lives and speaks through them, through her books. It is beyond doubt that the implied author is no other than the writer of the text, that's the official scribe who writes in this manner, or the writer who sets himself out with a different air, or the second self who writes the text through playing parts, trying on masks, or assuming roles. The difference between the implied author, that's the second self, and the real author, that's the first self, is that between the person assuming a certain air or adopting a particular stance while writing the text, and the same person in daily life, out of the writing process. If we turn our attention from the encoding process to the decoding process, the implied author is the textual image of the writer for the reader to infer. So here we have the encoding process and the decoding process. In the encoding process, the implied author is the person writing in a certain manner, making all the textual choices. And in the decoding process, the reader infers from all the choices made by the implied author. That's the person writing in a certain manner. The image of the implied author, that's the person who has written the text in a certain manner. As I analyzed in detail in my paper published in the 2011 special issue of Style on the implied author, Booth's frequent metaphorical expression of the real authors creating the implied author, coupled with his putting much more emphasis on the decoding process in his earlier work, has led to the assumption that the writer of the text is the real author who, when writing, literally creates the implied author. Uh, and the implied author is taking an entity uh, confined within the text. In this picture of the implied author, the episode implied is taken to be an antonym of historical, real, or actual. This fundamental decontextualization of the implied author has also played a role in the decontextualization of its counterpart, implied reader, or authorial audience. In my paper, What is the Implied Author, published in the 2011 special issue of Style, focusing on the implied author, I've cited Booth extensively to show that in Booth's formulation, the implied author is both the author, that's the writer of the text, and the authorial image implied by all his or her own textual choices for readers to infer. By contrast, the so-called real author, or the flesh and blood person, well, actually, in Booth's 2005 article, he used the FBP person. Yeah, this is a much, more, a much better concept than the real author, because uh, the so-called real author is actually outside the writing process. The flesh and blood person is the same person in daily life out of the writing process. To know the real author or the flesh and blood person, we read biographical materials. By contrast, to know the implied author of a text, we read the particular text itself. The implied author's image is implied by the textual choices he or she has made while authoring the text. It is significant that although Booth's implied author has a textual emphasis, it forms a key element in Booth's revision of the text-oriented position of the first generation of Chicago critics as represented by R.S. Crane. While Booth aims at distinguishing the role-playing writer of a text from the same person in daily life and in writing other texts, Crane is concerned with the isolation of the text from its very writer. Crane's method is a quote, uh, uh, a quote uh, okay, from his concept of plot. 
one which depends on the analytical isolation of works of art as finished products from the circumstances and the processes of their origin. It is better fitted to explain those effects which would be specifically the same in any other work of whatever date that was constructed in accordance with the same combination of artistic principles than those effects which must be attributed to the fact that the work was produced by a given artist. Compare this observation by Booth. Just as one's personal letters imply different versions of oneself, depending on the different relationships with each correspondent and the purpose of each letter, so the writer, that's the implied author, sets himself out with a different air depending on the needs of particular works. In contrast with Crane's emphasis on the same effects in any other work, Booth's emphasis is on the contrast among the different textual norms created by the different implied authors, depending on the different relationships with each targeted type of readers and the purpose of each text. While in Crane's poetic theory, we lose sight of the writer and only have in view a timeless and autonomous text. In Booth's rhetorical theory, it is, it is the communicative or the rhetorical purposes of the role-playing writer that form the focus of attention. Crane's work is very important in redressing the long-term neglect of poetic form, but he has gone too far in decontextualization and his and he also works in a realm above and beyond social and cultural history. However, I do not mean to suggest that when putting forward the concept of the implied author, Booth had in mind both a textual emphasis and a historical requirement. Booth followed the ahistorical position of the first generation of the Chicago school when writing the rhetoric of fiction in the middle of the 20th century a time marked by the reign of formalism. But as just discussed, in shifting from textual poetics to also audience rhetoric, Booth significantly revised the relation between the author, text, and the reader. In contrast with the first generation of the Chicago schools treating the textual effects to be authorless, that's the same in any other work, autonomous and timeless of whatever date, Booth emphasized the rhetorical purposes and the overall textual design of the implied author of a given text, who has in mind a particular type of audience while making the textual choices for producing specific rhetorical effects. Since the implied author necessarily writes in history, and his or her textual choices may be influenced by historical factors and since the type of audience the implied author has in mind is one with knowledge of the relevant historical factors, Booth's shifting from poetics to rhetoric enables the theory to take on a contextualizing potential, while the difference between the second and the first generations of, of the uh, Chicago school has been neglected, and the Booth's work is treated as as being decontextualized as the first generation of the Chicago school. But his work actually has laid the foundation for historicization because it has a historicizing potential. In other words, rhetorical theory's requirement for a correct understanding of the implied author's rhetorical purposes and the textual norms involves an implicit requirement of taking account of the relevant contextual factors. In the poetic theory of the first generation of Chicago critics, as represented by R.S. Crane, we not only lose sight of the particularity of the writer and only see a timeless and autonomous text, but also lose sight of the particularity of the reader. Indeed, in Ralph Reader's words, to Crane and Sachs, a 20th century reader taking Tom Jones from a drugstore rack could find himself in immediate contact with this moving aesthetic force, that is to say, with the essential meaning and the value of the novel. The case is essentially different with the rhetorical theory of the second and third generations of the Chicago critics 
as represented by Wayne Booth, James Phelan, and Peter J. Rabinovich. As already quoted, in Booth's view, the implied author of a given text sets himself out with a different air depending on the relationship with the particular type of reader as the implied reader. In the afterword to the second edition of the Rhetoric of Fiction, Booth subscribes to Rabinovich's distinction among authorial audience, that's the implied author's ideal or hypothetical, or hypothetical audience resembling Booth's implied reader, narrative audience uh, corresponding to the narrator, believing that the events of the story are real, and the flesh and blood actual audience. That's, uh, okay. Rabinovich defines the authorial audience as unequivocally contextualized. That's his definition. Rabinovich says, like a philosopher, historian, or journalist, the author of a novel cannot write without making certain assumptions about his reader's beliefs, knowledge, and the familiar familiarity with conventions. Dambi's The Catacombs, for instance, takes place during the early 60s, and the novel achieves its sense of impending doom only if the reader knows that uh, John F. Kennedy will be assassinated when the events of the novel reach 22, uh, 22 November 1963. Had Dunby assumed that his audience would be ignorant of this historical event, he would have had, he would have had to write, rewrite his work, his book, accordingly. Since the structure of the novel is designated for the author's hypothetical audience, which I call the authorial audience. Okay, the authorial audience is a contextualized audience, but this has been blocked from view. We must, as we read, come to share in some measure the characteristics of this audience, of this authorial audience, if we are to understand the text. So if we are to understand the textual norms correctly, we have to share the historical knowledge with the authorial audience, who corresponds to the implied author. In before reading, Rabinovich makes a more comprehensive discussion of the diversified assumptions the implied author has in mind when writing the text for his or her particular type of authorial audience. Rabinovich says, some assumptions are historical. Flaubert assumes considerable knowledge of the revolution of 1848 in sentimental education. Some are socio sociological. At least one critic has argued convincingly that the turn of the screw makes proper sense only to a reader who knows something about the conduct deemed proper to governesses in the 19th century. As the actual writer, the role-playing implied author creates the text in history, and his or her textual choices are often based on contextual information ac accessible to readers in that particular social historical period. In such cases, the authorial audience or implied reader, the implied author writes to, is essentially a contextualized or historicized audience. When the implied fielding was writing Tom Jones in 18th century England, he intended the novel for an authorial audience with the knowledge of, I quote reader, the Latitudinarians Latintudin and the 18th century thought, end quote. To borrow off readers' words, they are fieldings like-minded contemporary audience. Like-minded contemporary audience, the implied reader or the authorial audience is the implied author's like-minded readers. Okay. Um, to, and while reading Tom Jones, in the 20th or 21st century, France, America, or China, we need to take into account the relevant historical information in order to enter the position of fielding's like-minded authorial audience in that social historical context. In such cases, unless we enter the position of the implied author's like-minded authorial audience in history, we cannot gain an adequate understanding of the implied author's textual choices and the rhetorical purposes, and there cannot be successful communication between the implied author and us readers. Seeing in this light, the consideration of the historical context in which a text was produced is not only allowed, but also required by rhetorical narrative theory. However, this contextual requirement in rhetorical theory has been backgrounded, underdeveloped, and very much unacknowledged 
by many scholars both outside and inside the rhetorical camp. As time is limited, I cannot go into the factors that have blocked from view the contextual requirement of rhetorical theory. I've made a detailed discussion of this issue in my paper, implied also authorial audience and the context, form and history in rhetorical narrative theory, which will appear very soon in the May issue of the American Journal Narrative. It is worth mentioning that the rhetorical narrative theory with the concept of implied author and authorial audience has a stronger requirement of considering the historical context of literary creation than the theories of what Booth calls reader critics. If what matter are only analytical frameworks, epistemological perspectives, or subject positions of actual readers, we can ignore the implied author's rhetorical purposes and the thematic design in history and subject the text to present-day interpretive frameworks or subject positions. Precisely because rhetorical theory requires actual readers to find in the text, quote, what the implied author wanted them to find, and I quote, I quote, for, I quote Booth. Actual readers need to take into consideration the historical context in order to enter the implied author's like-minded audience in history. Otherwise, there cannot be successful communication between the implied author and us readers. Do I have time to go on? Conclusion, Conclusion. okay. I jump two pages. To conclude, the post... To, con to conclude, the post-classical narratological period is marked by various attempts to connect form with context. There is no doubt that we need to t investigate the contextualized significance of narrative forms in texts as communicative acts, and we need to trace the historical development of narrative structures. But in terms of narrative poetics, we have to leave aside the specific contexts and focus on the structural properties shared by specific uses in narrative texts across cultural and historical contexts. On the surface, we have a rectifying evolution from a formal narrative poetics to contextualized feminist poetics, cognitive poetics, or other contextualized poetics. But in fact, as far as the investigation of generic structures is concerned, we have to leave aside various specific contexts and focus on the decontextualized structural properties shared within the genre. Either the genre is narrative or a type of narrative. As indicated by Nancy's and Herman's investigations, feminist poetics and cognitive poetics are similarly decontextualized. And they function to consolidate and enrich rather than to subvert formal narrative poetics. In the case of rhetorical narrative theory, although it has been criticized as decontextualized approach, contextualist challenges actually function to bring into play the the contextualizing potential in, rhetor in rhetorical narrative theory itself. That is to say, the picture is in fact not as controversial or diverse as it has appeared. In various contextualist approaches, form and history can exist harmoniously in a similar relation between decontextualized poetics and the contextualized criticism. And in rhetorical narrative theory, form and history can in fact enjoy a balance since the theory has, in essence, a textual emphasis and a historical emphasis. Thank you. <laughs>